Accord Worldwide Bible Study, Work of the Holy Spirit, uh, part two on Paul's sermon. Hopefully you guys can see this okay. Um, this is an outline of, of, uh, of Paul's missionary journeys. So, first missionary journey, here it is at the bottom. Let me just make some adjustments here. Participants go down here. Chat goes over here. This goes over there. All right, now we're cooking with gas. First missionary journey, Acts 13 to 14. Uh, and we see that Paul travels around. Here's his first sermon. It's Acts 13. And it's his preaching on the Sabbath in the synagogue in Antioch. Now, one of the amazing things that Luke does in the book of Acts is he pulls seven sermons from seven different circumstances. And one of the things that we'll notice is that Paul uh, uses the text of the people to whom he's preaching. So when he preaches in the synagogue, he preaches from the Old Testament. Uh, the Jerusalem Council is Acts chapter 15. Then we have the second missionary journey. That's Acts 15 to 18, and that's their loop to where they go over to Corinth, uh, down into Greece. And here's his second sermon, Acts 17, 22 to 31. He preaches that in the Areopagus. That's Mars Hill, which is a little rock outcropping um, down the hill from the big thing that I can't remember in Athens? What's the Acropolis? The Acropolis is the big hill where the temple to Athena and all that is. And then down, there's a little kind of outcropping over where the philosophers sit. That's Mars Hill. And Paul preaches there. And when he preaches there, he quotes the pagan poets as his text. Uh, he goes back to Jerusalem and to Antioch. Then we have the third missionary journey. That's Acts 18 to 21. And that's where Paul goes straight to Ephesus, basically. And this here, he, Paul's in Ephesus for a long time. He's, uh, he's, he's for three years in Ephesus. He travels to Macedonia and Greece. He goes, um, remember he preaches, this is where he, he goes to Troas. He preaches until midnight. The boy falls asleep and falls out of the window, and he raises him from the dead. Uh, he goes to Miletus, and then here's his... Here's his uh, sermon that we're looking at, Paul in Miletus, Acts chapter 20, verses 18 to 35. This is, as far as I can tell, the only sermon that Paul preached to a group of Christians. All the other sermons are evangelical sermons to non-Christians outside the church. And notice that when he, when he preaches to the synagogue, he quotes the Old Testament. When he preaches to the Athenians, he quotes the, the pagan poets. When he preaches to the Christians, he quotes Jesus. It's more blessed to give than to receive, which is a text, it's a it's a word from Jesus that we don't have recorded in the gospel. But Paul has it there. Uh, then Paul, here we have Paul addresses the, um, oh, where are we? Paul goes back to Jerusalem. He's imprisoned. He's taken to Caesarea, uh, in, and he's there for a few years in prison. Then he goes back to Rome. That's the outline here. That's I don't know, Acts chapter 21 to, to, to the end. But so we have his fourth sermon. He addresses the mob in Jerusalem from the barrack steps. Then he goes and he addresses Felix, Acts 24. He addresses King Agrippa, Acts 26. And then he addresses the Jewish leaders in Rome, Acts 28. So those are the kind of last four sermons that we have here. So here's all of them that hear this, all seven sermons uh, where Paul preaches there. So so now, to the text. We want to look at Acts chapter 20. So we got, I think, to verse 24-ish last time. So let's let's see what we can do here. So he goes. Paul goes from, uh, uh, he sails past Ephesus to Miletus, because he knew that if he went to Miletus, he'd be there for another three years or something. And then he preaches this to all the pastors. I think it's an ordination sermon. You know, from the first day I came to Asia, uh, what, what manner I lived among you, serving the Lord with all humility, with many tears and trials, what, uh, which happened to me by the plotting of the Jews. So tears and trials. Um, everywhere Paul went, he was... Um, what he was it's like the it's like there was a mob who just followed Paul and chased him around to afflict him and give him trouble 
So what, whatever the devil was in his in his trail, just giving him grief. So he he learned theology through tentat, through affliction. Uh, the plotting of the Jews. This is what we call them the Judaizers, the people who traveled at back around just following Paul, saying his gospel wasn't true gospel. It's too much gospel, not enough law. He says, "How I kept back nothing that was helpful, but proclaimed it to you, taught you publicly from house to house, testifying to Jews, also to Greeks, repentance toward God, and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ." This is a beautiful example of law and gospel. I got a wonderful email last night from someone that said that they've been, I don't know, they stumbled across some YouTube something of mine, and they said they've been studying theology for years and years, and they were waiting for that distinction between law and gospel to make everything clear. So let me spread them apart a little bit so I can make a chart. So it's good for sometimes for us to go back to the basics and remember that the Lord speaks in two words. He speaks in his word of law and he speaks in his word of, of gospel. And the law is uh, what God commands of us so this is the command, and the gospel is the promise. Now, it's good to remember, I mean, that, that there's promises also with the law. So you obey your father and your mother, and it'll go well with you, and you'll live long in the land that the Lord your God has given you. But the promises of the law are always conditional. The gospel is always unconditional promise. So the law tells us what to do. The gospel tells us what God has done. So, do us, done God. The law is summarized in the Ten Commandments. And that's God's perfect will for our lives. It describes his holiness. But the gospel is the, uh, is the life and especially the suffering and the death of Jesus. So the law shows our sins, but the gospel forgives sins. Um, the, the, the law is, shows our guilt, and the gospel imputes to us the righteousness of Christ. Remember, there is a righteousness of the law, which is what we do, but because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The righteousness of faith is made known. So the law demands obedience. That we that's and but the, the gospel invites faith, trusting in in His promise. Now all, all of these things. So both the law and the gospel are words from God. The Lord speaks the law and the Lord speaks the gospel. But the law and the gospel have different purposes. The law, in fact, in the end kills, not because it's deadly, but because we're unholy. But the gospel brings life. And these two words are throughout the Holy Scriptures. The Lord in one place promises and demands, or sorry, demands and um, requires, and in another place he gives. So we learn the Ten Commandments in the, um, in the Catechism, but we also learn the Creed, what the Lord has done. And the goal of theology, at least one of the goals of theology, is to uh, always keep these two things separate from one another. Well, maybe let's not say separate. To keep these two things distinct from one another so that they don't cross over, that they don't touch, that they don't get confused, that you don't get gospel. Um, you that 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 our own doing and, and acting creeps in to the promise of salvation that the Lord has given us over here. Do we do good works? Absolutely. But are we righteous by those good works? No. That comes to us in the gospel. And so Paul is and so and our Lutheran confessions kind of wonderfully say that this distinction between law and gospel is a most brilliant light. And until you have it, until you have this um until you have this distinction, the scriptures remain, they say, a closed book. But when we, uh, but, but when we uh, 
have this distinction of law and gospel, now the scriptures begin to open up and we can understand them. And so we see Paul's uh, preaching of law and gospel here when he says, I came preaching uh, repentance towards God, law, and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ, gospel. That's what's going on there. Okay. And see now, I go bound in the Spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations await me. This is this curious verse that we talked about last time that is so I think it's so important, and there's some real wisdom in here, but I can't get there yet. I'm working on it, so you guys got to be patient with me. But So the Holy Spirit keeps coming to Paul directly through, through prophets and pastors and telling Paul that when he goes to Jerusalem, chains and tribulations await me. Now the question is, was the Holy Spirit trying to prevent Paul from going to Jerusalem, it in most of the incidences that are recounted, now this is a big theme of this section of the of the book of Acts. Paul has his heart and mind set on getting to Jerusalem in time for the feast. And remember, he gets there and he's arrested because they said that he took Gentiles with him into the temple, and that's why he was arrested. He was carried. I mean, he was almost stoned right in the middle of the city. The Greeks carried him up and arrested him, and then it's his nephew that makes known to him the plot that these Jews made that they they said, we're not going to eat or drink anything until Paul's dead. And he passes that on to the guard, and then the cavalry takes Paul out of Jerusalem off the hill, down over to Caesarea, and that, that whole drama unfolds there. In, in almost every case where the Holy Spirit testified, saying that chains and tribulations await me, it's given to us as a warning, but there are a couple of times where it seems to indicate, like the Holy Spirit was saying to Paul, don't go to Jerusalem. I'm telling you this so that you can avoid it, so that you can avoid getting having all this trouble. And Paul doesn't stop. He doesn't change his plans. He still goes. So even though the Holy Spirit was warning him, he he goes to Jerusalem anyways. And the Lord uses that. Now, what do we make of this? I don't know. (laughs) I don't I, I I don't wonder if. One of the things that we're supposed to learn here is that Paul was operating on the principle of sola scriptura, so that these private revelations that were coming to him were not binding revelations. Private revelations are not binding. Only the scriptures are binding. So if the Holy Spirit says through a prophet, I don't want you to go to Jerusalem, Paul can say, well, I'm going to go anyways, because private revelations are not binding. But I... I don't think I can say that with 100% certainty, but we see at least in Paul, the other option to say is that Paul sinned by going to Jerusalem, and maybe that's it. Maybe he just wouldn't, but he explains why. Because everyone's distressed. I mean, everybody knows that all this trouble is waiting for Paul in Jerusalem, but then he says, none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself so that I may finish my race with joy and the ministry which I have received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. The gospel is about God's grace, not about our works, but about God's grace. But Paul wants to finish his joy, finish his race with joy. He says this to Timothy, 2 Timothy, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. There is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. So, So this is our goal and this is our work too to finish the race. In fact, we were looking at this in um, in Wichita last week. Oh, I wonder if I should just jump over there real quick. That there's, um, that, that Paul will give three examples, whoops, of things that we should think of for the Christian life um, here in 2 Timothy. Uh, and the athlete is one of them. Yeah, here it is. Here's the three things that Paul... And so Paul Paul would think of the, the Christian life 
uh, as an athletic contest. In fact, here's the three metaphors that Paul gives, uh, so we're in 2 Timothy chapter 2, the three metaphors that Paul gives for living the Christian life. So you must therefore endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. So the Christian life is warfare. The Christian is a soldier. And he says, why? No one engaged in warfare and tangles himself in the affairs of this life, that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. And also, if anyone competes in athletics, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. And then a hardworking farmer must be the first to partake of the crops. So Paul uses three pictures for the Christian life, a fight, a race, and a field. So these are things to meditate. In fact, he, he, Paul then has us, gives us the command to meditate on these things. Consider what I say, and may the Lord give you understanding in all things. So Paul calls us to meditate on these three uh, particular images of the Christian life and also of the ministry. So the Christian life in general, but the, uh, talking to Timothy, this is also of the ministry. And then he ends this with the his... Um, uh, his kind of final words. I'm already being poured out as a drink offering. The time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. There's the fight. I have finished the race. That's the athletics. I have kept the faith. That's the farming illustration, I suppose. Finally, there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, judgment day. Not to me only, but all who have loved his appearing. This is. A, can you imagine that this is the the description of the Christian, those who love the appearing of Jesus. So fought the fight, finished the race. That's what Paul is talking about also in Acts chapter uh, twenty. I'm striving towards the end so that I might finish the race. So let's go back to it. Uh, and look at this also that Paul wants to finish my race with joy so that he can cross the finish line with triumph and the ministry I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. That's a beautiful phrase. The gospel, the good news of the grace of God. Remember this word gospel uh, means oiangelion. We've talked about this before, but I think the picture is well worth is well worth repeating, and that is that you know, you're, in, you're in the village here, Here's where you live. Here's your house over here. And the armies are coming to attack. Um, but they go over the hills to the battlefield. So here the soldiers go off to war. And you see the you see the smoke from the battle rising up. You hear the sounds of the battle rising up, but you don't know you don't know what happened over there. You don't know who won. Uh, you don't know if the army that's going to come back over the hill marching here is going to be your sons and husbands and uh, and grandfathers marching back with victory, or if it's going to be the enemies marching back to destroy you and set the village on fire. And so, so what happens? When the battle's over, uh, someone, a survivor, a, a, a runner— runs back, whoosh, 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 and he announces the news. And it's going to be either good news, we won, victory, Nike, or we lost, run for it. And that's the, this is the, this, the news of victory coming from over the hill, that's the, uh, that's the Oyan Gelion. That the that's the that's the gospel, the good news. So I always think that the pastor should should mount up the pulpit, sort of breathless from the front, and saying, "We won, Jesus won the victory. It's ours." The 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 and and this good news is that God is gracious in Christ. You know, running from the empty tomb, running from the cross running from the war that Jesus uh, had with the devil and and giving the good news that God is not angry, but that he delights in us.
Now, where are we? Okay. Indeed, I know that I know that you all, verse 25 here, among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, will see my face no more. Let's just have an equivalency between the gospel of the grace of God and the kingdom of God. We have to be careful with the um when when you see people emphasizing the language of the kingdom of God, um just let a little warning bell go off in your mind because there's a lot of shenanigans that have been kind of put on the church as a kingdom theology, uh, either trying to make the kingdom of God manifest in this world, kind of a post-millennial thing, or also some social justice stuff, or move away from the doctrine of justification to more charismatic. Anyway, just when you hear someone who's emphasizing a lot the kingdom of God, just just say, okay, I'm going to pay careful attention to what they're saying here. I mean, we should use the language all the time, but the kingdom of God is the church. The kingdom of God is where Jesus rules and reigns as Lord and Savior by his name and his word. The kingdom and the gospel are used in parallel here. Uh, you will see my face no more. Oh, this is the, what? This is the sad thing. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men. Paul had a good conscience, not only according to the gospel, but also according to his vocation. Paul could say that I have done all that the Lord has charged me to do. Now, did he sin in that? Absolutely, he sinned in it. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Paul says, I'm the chief of sinners. There's no perfection here. But Paul can say that I've discharged my duties faithfully so that we have a good conscience towards God only by the death of Jesus. But we have a good conscience toward each other by faithfully living in our vocations. I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. There's always a danger who, there's these famous quotes. Some of you, no doubt, will know them. You could put them in the chat, maybe. Like, I don't know if it's, a, I mean, maybe Luther, or one of these famous old preachers, said that if you preach the truth in all of its fullness, except on that point where it is being challenged, then you were not faithful. I, I think, I've been thinking a lot about this, uh, and uh, I can't remember if we talked about it recently, but I, I think that it's, um, it's good for us to think of um, the gift of heresy. Now, that might sound very funny. The gift of heresy. Because heresy is, of course, a sin, false doctrine, <coughs> false teaching that comes into the church or comes to the Christian in any way. I think all we can think of heresy in terms of worldview and everything. But, and so we want to always fight against it, but it comes to us as a gift. Uh, number one is it gives us a chance to confess. Uh, to confess the truth. So the, the Arian heresy, for example, which denied that Jesus was God, gave a chance for the church to confess the truth of the divinity of Jesus. But it also gives us a chance to clarify the truth. This, not that. So that the, uh, the, the debates about, for example, salvation by works that happened in the Reformation gave us a chance to really clarify the gospel and the distinction between law and gospel. And this clarity of the truth helps support sola scriptura, In other words, we're able to distinguish between what we were holding on to as if we're not, if our beliefs are not challenged, then we don't have to go back and make sure that what we're holding to and asserting is biblically true, or if it's just something that we've inherited from tradition. So I think, for example, of feminism, just to take an example of feminism, and Feminism comes along, and it's, in in some ways, especially second-wave feminism, has, there's a lot of heretical doctrine. There's a lot of false doctrine in feminism. But what it does is it allows us to go back to the Scriptures and say, what is a man and what is a woman 
from the Bible, not from culture. Because we inherited a lot of stuff, just came along through history and through culture, and it gives us an opportunity to sort of peel the barnacles of tradition off of our doctrine and clarify what the Scripture says, which is great. And the third thing is it gives us an opportunity for courage. So that if the truth was never opposed, it would ne- you would never need to be courageous to stand up and assert the truth. But the, uh, when a false doctrine comes along, to stand up and to speak to that false doctrine and to, and to be troubled for it or afflicted for it or whatever, now we have a chance to be courageous. And that's a gift that the Lord gives, that we could stand up and be courageous. So every generation has their own heresies. Apparently now, our heresy, this is exciting, is the fact that there's no such thing as men and women anymore. Sheesh. And so, and so that's actually helpful for us, because it goes back and it says, we can say, okay, what does the Bible truly say about God creating male and female? And all that sort of stuff. And how can we look at what the Bible teaches us about male and female versus what the culture has taught us about male and female, and tradition has taught us about this? And also, we can be apparently courageous, because you can get canceled or lose your job or whatever, by saying that there's a such thing as male and female, which seems a ridiculous thing to be persecuted for, but now, you know, now that's the, that's the deal. So we thank God for this because the, not because the heresy is there, it's it's terrible and it'll, you know, people uh, will bang their head against the wall of heresy. And if, if they don't split their head open, they at least will get a headache. And so we lament every false doctrine, but we also can thank the Lord for it because it gives us opportunity to to do these things. Now, the point, though, is that Paul is saying here, and this is what he says, I did not shun to you to declare the whole counsel of God. And so so this pressure to not declare the whole counsel of God against a particular point that's being disputed that pressure comes to the preacher and the pastor. And Paul's saying that, that I felt that pressure, but I did not cave to that pressure or follow that pressure, but rather I stayed true. Therefore, now Paul is giving himself here as an example. Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. This was the word bishop, I believe. What's this word here? Um, Episcopos. Uh, is it not going to tell me? i got to clear my drawing so I can... Which the Holy Spirit has made you... Oh, it's down here a little bit. There it is. Episcopos. Um, so take heed to yourself and to all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you... Whoops wrong button, has made you overseers. To sh- Now, this is why we know that Paul is talking to a bunch of pastors or guys about to be pastors. To shepherd or to pastor the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Now, here, just please note that, that the, the Bible will move so sort of beautifully mysteriously whoops between the um between the image of the shepherd and the lamb and this happens all the time it happens in first peter and it happens in revelation it happens in john it happens in all of these things it is that the is that we move back and forth between the shepherd and the lamb so Jesus is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And his blood, the blood of the Lamb, purchased the church, which now the pastors are to shepherd. So we are shepherding the flock that was purchased by the, the blood of, of Jesus. So Jesus is both the good shepherd, the chief shepherd, and the Lamb, both. In fact, in, it says it in Revelation— the lamb who sits in the midst of the throne will shepherd them. 
So just notice how this goes back and forth. So who's the shepherd here in this case? It's the pastors, the bishops, the overseers. They're shepherding the flock which was purchased by his own blood. Now the other magnificent theological point here, which makes this verse right here one of the most important verses in the whole scripture, is that whose blood is this? It's the blood of God. And that language taught to us in this in this particular text, that language of the blood of God gives us a way of talking about God through the incarnation of Jesus. So if you can talk about the blood of God, if of God belongs blood, you can also talk about the body, and you can also talk about the death. I mean, if God has this, he has this, and he has this. So that the death of Jesus is the death of God. Now, did the Father die? No. Did the Holy Spirit die? No. Does the Father and Son have blood? No. Does the Father, they were not, they did not participate in the incarnation. But you can, because you can speak of the blood of God, you can speak, for example, of the mother of God. This was the big controversy with, uh, uh uh-oh, Nestorius, is that can you call Mary the mother of God? Well, if you can speak of the blood of God and the death of God and the body of God and the suffering of God, you can speak of the mother of God only and precisely because of the incarnation. So this text here is is a key text for our understanding of the incarnation and the work of Jesus. Now, finally, to our point here, why we're hanging around this text is because we are apparently doing a study of the Holy Spirit. And here we see that it is the Holy Spirit who made these guys overseers in the church of God. Now, how did he make them overseers is through their call. But we confess that the Holy Spirit works through the call. So the call is a means or an instrument of the Holy Spirit but it is a earthly means. Just like water is a earthly means for baptism and, and bread and wine are earthly means for the sacrament, so the church is the means through which the pastor, or the God the Holy Spirit, puts pastors in his church. So where does my call come from? Does it come from the Holy Spirit? Yes. Does it come from the church? Yes. Both are true. But I have to be, I have to have this confidence that it is God the Holy Spirit who has made me an overseer. And that's why I do my work as a pastor with the fear of God, knowing that the Lord has done it. That's why Paul could say, I've shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. There might be things that are fearful to say, but we don't have the option of not saying them. Paul says that because, because look, the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, and it's overseers of his church, his flock, which he purchased with his own blood. Is the shepherd, Clark asked, uh, oh, Jane asked, look at this, can the kingdom be in your heart? Uh, Yes, the kingdom of God is where the Holy Spirit rules according to the word of God, which includes our heart, but it includes also our everything. It includes our bodies, it includes our homes, it includes our our faith, uh, it includes our families, it includes even our neighborhoods, as we uh, live in them and sanctify them and so forth. Clark asked, is the shepherd responsible for the lamb wanders off? The answer is yes. The lamb is also responsible, but the shepherd is also responsible, which is a burden that just even you saying that, Clark, makes me go, ugh, because I know my own weakness and my own failures to go and track people down. Finding the, the people that have wandered from church was already the most difficult task of a pastor. And COVID has amplified that times five. So, so but yes, it is. That, that's no excuse. That's just saying that that's part of the hard work of the, uh, of the overseers is to try to go find the people who have wandered from the flock. Uh, Oliver notes, and this has to do with the, with the kingdom being in your heart, Jesus' words from Luke 17, where he says, the kingdom of God is, uh, and 
it is either within you or among you. The literal translation is in your midst. The kingdom of God is in your midst, uh, in the middle of you. And so that can be either in the middle of each one of you in your heart or as the Lord gathers, or probably in that context, when Jesus says the kingdom of God is in your midst, he's pointing to himself. Because where the king is, there is his kingdom. Okay. Um, ah, someone says, Tolstoy wrote, the kingdom of God is within you. That's quoting that Luke text. Do we need to look at that Luke text in a minute? Let's finish this sermon. Um, uh, Barb says, do you think the pastoral burden about going after the lost lambs who have wandered away spurs so many on to try different types of worship? I, that could be part of it. We want to get people back. We want to... We want to try to win people for the gospel, so we're going to try to make things appealing for them. It's probably never a good strategy to begin with, but anyway, let's see here. Oh, yeah, for I know this. Oh, now here's warning. And this is Paul now acting prophetically. For I know that after my departure, savage wolves, remember we're, Here's the church, which is the flock, and here's the lamb and the sacrifice, and here's the shepherd. Savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also, from among you. So come in and from. Uh, From among yourselves, men will rise up speaking perverse things, crooked things, to draw away the disciples after themselves. Christians are here called disciples. We should all know that the Lord has called us to be his disciples, to draw away the disciples after themselves. So the false teacher is always trying to drag people after themselves. Therefore, watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone day and night with tears. Now, we see the, maybe the contrast. Here's Paul's tears. Here's Paul's joy. He is tears and joy all mixed up together. So we want to watch and we want to remember. Now this this watching here that uh, to which um, to which Paul as whoops to which Paul especially calls the teachers to be watchers is a re- repetition of the Lord's warning, warning when he in this in the Sermon on the Mount uh, gives us this command to beware. Now I, I tracked this down at some point. I, I'm not sure if I if I did it 100 percent right, but I, I think that at least almost every time, if not every time, we see the word beware in the scriptures. The thing that it's telling us to be aware of is false teachers, false teaching, and false teachers. Both. Jesus says they come in to your midst like wolves. Uh, in sheep's clothing, so wolves that look like sheep. And Paul picks up on that language. He calls them savage wolves. Jesus, in fact, calls them uh, hungry wolves, wolves with growling to try to to try to win away the the flock. And so the pastor, like a shepherd, and that, by the way, is the same word. So the word for shepherd and the word for pastor is the exact same Greek word. You could just have to go from the context. Is it talking about pastoring or is it talking about shepherding? But the it's, it's both. Same exact word, poimain. So the shepherd has the job not only of leading the sheep to the cool water, but also protecting them from the wolves. And so protecting the church from the wolves is standing up and fighting against false doctrine. It has to do with warning so that the people won't be dragged away because the most dangerous thing in the world is false teaching. I mean, you know, someone could feed you poison and it kills your body, but someone feeds you false doctrine and it kills your faith. That's what you have to look out for. Uh, Leanne says, is this is that applying the Stephen ministry concept in churches, or is that church growth concept? Um, the, so I don't know too much about Stephen's ministry. I know this question has come up a handful of times. Um, I, I think the Stephen ministry probably has some good impulses and some bad impulses kind of mixed up together. But 
I, I, to put the best construction on Stephen's ministry, this is where um, lay people are um, trained in the church to try to serve um, to serve people who are in need or distress. So kind of a light counselor thing. And understanding that the, the in a, especially in a large church, the pastor doesn't necessarily have time to get to everyone, nor can he, um, this sort of thing. And so I think it's there. I, I, I see the rise in the sort of... Um, the, the therapeutic approach to this it, it, um, comes from the breakdown of the vocation of friend. And so this realization that we've lost kind of genuine friendships in the church, and so now we want to we want to kind of support that with a with a semi institution. I see that as Stephen's ministry is trying to do that, but I, that, that's maybe putting the best construction on things. There's a in, part of the church growth movement was that the pastor's job was to train people to do the ministry rather than do the ministry himself. And I think that's um, that's that's wrong. Uh, Barb says it seems like we should start new churches congregations if the church gets too big for the pastor. Um, I do too. At least I did until I got a church that's too big. So <laughs> anyway, uh, can you speak of the pitfalls of the emphasis of kingdom talk that you were mentioning? Yeah, the if we so. The day, uh, here's the thing to look out for. If you hear someone talking so much about the kingdom of God and they're not talking about the gospel, in other words, they're talking about the rule of God or the reign of God and they're not talking about the blood of Jesus and the forgiveness of sins, then they're using the kingdom, the language of the kingdom to pull away from the central article, which is the death and resurrection of Jesus. Okay, I want to finish this sermon of Paul's I thought we had other stuff to do too, but okay. So, but we gotta we gotta finish this here, and then we're gonna be out of time already. I can't believe it. So, okay. So, verse thirty-two. Uh, so now, brethren, I commend you to God and to His word of grace, which is also able to build you up and give. So, this edification job, building up. So, it's we switch from the flock to the building metaphor, which is great, and to give you an inheritance. This is the family talk. So, remember all these pictures of the church that we have, these beautiful images that kind of run through. So, the, uh, the church is the flock, and the church is the family, and the church is the, the marriage. Whoa. Oh, that's a funny... The church, is a, uh, the church is the temple, the church is... All these sorts of things. So, he moves from flock, family, marriage, temple. So, he moves from the flock here to the building, to the temple, to the church as a family, to give you an inheritance among those who are sanctified. That means made holy by the forgiveness of sins and by the Spirit in, uh, giving good works. I have coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. So Paul did his work without mm, jealousy or greed. Yes, uh, you yourselves know that these hands have provided for my necessities and for those who are with me. So Paul worked in probably in Corinth and also in, in Ephesus. Paul was working to support his own ministry. Paul will say, and this is a funny thing for Paul, Paul will say that uh, the, the laborer is worthy of his hire, so that you should pay the pastors, and yet Paul never, it seems like, took a salary, at least not normally. Paul was always working to support himself, which was, I think, so that the so that he could avoid the accusation that he was being becoming wealthy or whatever by the gospel. So he was always working, and they knew it. You were with me. I have shown you in every way by laboring like this that you must support the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus. He said, "It is more blessed to give than to receive." So the words of Jesus are quoted here as the capstone of, of Paul's sermon. Now, where did Jesus say that? We don't know. It's not in the Gospels. So Paul gives us an extra word from our Lord, which is a great gift to us. How did Paul know about it? Probably from Peter uh, or from one of the other apostles. Maybe Mark heard him say it. And so we have this 
a word. It's in red, even though it's in the book of Acts, because it's a direct quote from Jesus. And when he hits, and he ends with that, remember what Jesus says, more blessed to give than to receive, which means God who is blessed above all is the one who gives all things, and we then who are the children of God are blessed in giving to everyone else. And we know this even from experience, that joy comes not in receiving but in giving. And to truly give something, to really give a gift is really one of the best things ever. And yet we forget it. We think, ah, this is part of our consumer society. I want to receive more, 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 more. The more I consume, the happier I am. Whereas we know that true happiness comes not in receiving but in serving. We know that from Jesus and we know it also just from our lives. But it's good to remember. And when he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. You can see them all kneeling down praying. They all wept freely. They fell on Paul's neck. They kissed him, sorrowing most of all for the words which he spoke that they would see his face no more. And they accompanied him to the ship. And off he goes to Jerusalem to be arrested. Okay? So there we have Paul's sermon. What a glorious, beautiful, fantastic, great, nice, I can't think of any, it was just fantastic, I said that one already. Wonderful, probably said that one too. Sermon from St. Paul. And the key thing that we were looking at here is this business of the Holy Spirit who controls the appointment of leaders in the church. The Holy Spirit sets people apart for his um, for his work. Okay. Uh, well, we should stop there, I suppose, because we've been at it for a bit. Um, but so we'll, um, I'll say a quick prayer and shut things down, and then we'll take some more questions in the chat, and I'll let you guys jump on as well. But let's close with a prayer. Oh, Lord, we thank you for your word, which gives us life and hope and peace and the forgiveness of all of our sins. We pray that by your Holy Spirit, we would rightly distinguish between your law and your gospel, and that you would, again, by the Holy Spirit, grant us repentance and faith, that you would keep us in your name and your word in your life, in your peace, which endures uh, in your kingdom now and in the kingdom to come. Bring us all to the joy of the resurrection and keep us all in the fellowship of your kindness. For we ask this all through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, world without end. Amen.